Hello, fellow Fight fans, and welcome to the Untitled Fightcast number 010. Finally, breaking into the double digits, and I'm so happy that we've made it this far, and I'm excited to one day break into those triple digits. But this week, we're going to be talking about one of the best fight cards in quite a while, UFC number 248. From the return of Sean O'Malley to the greatest title fight in women's UFC history, possibly the greatest fight in women's MMA overall, book ended by a very, very strange main event between Odessonia and Romero, but I just want to jump straight into this, so wrap up, lock in, and let's get it started. All right, so I'm just going to start with the elephant in the room, and that's the main event. This was hyped to be an epic fight between one of the most creative and talented strikers in all of MMA and a man who is as explosive as they come while also defying age itself. And it wasn't even close to that. Despite being possibly Yoel's last chance at the title, he did basically nothing to try and get the belt. His strategy was to wait for Izzy to strike and counter him, which on a couple couple of occasions he was able to do, but for the most part, he was relying on knocking Izzy out with one punch, but Izzy slipped most of those punches, and when he did get hit, he didn't even get stumbled, he didn't get rocked. The best shot by Romero was the first one he landed in the very first round, which Izzy admitted in his post-fight press conference interview that it did make him see double. You can see him trying to blink it away, but he didn't back down, he got a little bit of a knot above the eye, but that was about it and he stayed lucid enough to keep on fighting and keep his defense up. And the longer the fight went, the better he was able to read that counter left from Romero. But Izzy eventually just started chopping at Yoel's legs with some hard, hard leg kicks. And by the end of the fight, there were multiple welts and swelling, redness on his leg. It, it was pretty bad. Izzy also had a really nice body kick in the third that echoed around the arena. The style bender in counter the style that he actually hadn't prepared for, but as his name suggests, he made the adjustments with the light kicks, whereas Yoel continued to stick to his plan and it ended up not working for him. A game plan that was more or less to basically just not fight. He wanted Izzy to fight and just catch him with a solid punch and put him down. And while that's not a terrible plan, and in a way, it kind of shut down Izzy's offense, again, it, it just wasn't enough. I mean, this guy, Romero, he's an Olympic silver medalist in wrestling, and he basically never uses his wrestling. He took Adesanya down one once, but Izzy quickly popped back up to his feet so quickly, in fact, that it didn't even count as a takedown on the official stats. And then when Romero didn't win, he said that Izzy is the one that didn't do enough work or didn't fight, even though Izzy threw more on the numbers, landed more, and Izzy was the one leading the dance. Romero was basically defensive the entire time, and Romero has always been a guy that kind of chills out and then bursts forward with offense. Offense, but I, there were basically no bursts of offense. He landed two good left hands the entire fight. There was one moment where he had Izzy against the fence in the second round, and Izzy looked like he was in a tiny bit of trouble because you know that Romero can just be a savage and maul you, but it was literally, I think, maybe three or four seconds, and Izzy might have done enough even to steal the round. Uh, that round was pretty close for me, in, in my opinion, and a lot of people think that maybe Romero stole the last round with some of the pressure he put on. But again, it's, it's all up for debate. And that's the problem here. I mean, seriously, there was quite a number of analysts, spectators, YouTube commentators that said after the fight, they had scored the fight for Romero. And thank God they're not judges because I really don't think that's accurate. And speaking of judges, one judge gave Izzy four out of the five rounds. And to be honest, as much as I love this guy as a fighter, as much as I love Israel, I really do think that Yoel, in my opinion, he, I mean, he definitely took the first round with that one good shot, although Big John McCarthy even said that that probably could have been scored and maybe even should have been scored as a 10-10 round, which really never happens. But, you know, I, I just think that Yoel took the 
first two due to damage because he did score one good solid left hand in the second round and had Izzy in trouble for those couple of seconds. And even though Izzy landed more strikes, I think Yoel did just a little bit more damage, literally just with that one strike. But I think damage is the most important thing when it comes to fighting because you're supposed to be trying to put your opponent away. I think really the only true, true contentious round was the fifth one. And a lot of people gave that to Romero. But at the end of the day, Izzy just made the proper adjustments to not keep getting caught and to do damage of his own. All that being said, this actually is the best setup, I think, for an amazing fight with Paolo Costa because Izzy could have went out there and if he had put Romero away, yes, it would have been legendary and would have made Israel's stock shoot up, skyrocket into the atmosphere. But the amount of shit talking that came from Paolo Costa after this match really, I think, is what sets up this already budding rivalry to be something extra special. Adesanya is afraid. He's afraid to fight against big guys. I will hit him so badly. He will cry inside the cage. When I go inside the cage, I will not wait for him. He's not born to fight. I think he's born to be dancer. I mean, there was already tension and Costa was supposed to be the original one in line, but he was injured. So it went to Romero. And now when Paolo Costa ends up bringing the fight to Israel and giving the style bender something to work with, a style to bend. I mean, I really, truly think that he's going to end up eating his words against the most creative striker that we have right now in the game. So, Joanna called it in every single interview. She said this was going to be the single greatest fight that has ever taken place in the strawweight division of the UFC. But I'd like to add on to that. After watching this, this was, without a doubt, the single greatest fight that has ever taken place, irregardless of the weight class, in all of women's mixed martial arts, whether or not it's in the UFC. I mean, this was a five round war. And the best part is that we finally know who Zhang Wei Li is as a fighter, truly, because before this, she had never been out of the third round. Her fight with Andrade was scheduled for five rounds, but that shit was over in the first. And in the fourth round, in the fifth, she looked strong, crisp, right up till the very end. And man, can she take a shot because Joanna was piecing her up. That being said, Joanna was fucked up by the end of that fight. Her forehead was so swollen. The first thought that came to my mind was that she looked like an actual alien. Both women ended up skipping the post-fight press conference and just went straight to the hospital. But Ioana's head is going to be throbbing for a couple days, probably. And on top of that, her nose was broken. Between the two women, they threw 768 strikes. I mean, holy hell. And by the end of it, Wei Li had actually outthrown Joanna 408 to 360. But Joanna, being slightly more efficient, actually outlanded Wei Li 186 to 165. But from the damage done to Joanna, it's very clear who had the hardest strikes between the two ladies. And I believe that's why Zhang Wei Li won. But this was so freaking close. I mean, the scores were all. All over the freaking place on the judges cards to the point that both landed the exact same number of leg shots at 58 and the same number of head shots at 96. The only difference being that Ioana landed 32 body shots outnumbering Wei Li's 11. But even round by round, three out of the five were literally dead even with both of them landing 30 significant strikes in round one, 38 apiece in round three, and both landing 40 significant strikes in the fourth. I mean, this was one of the most evenly matched, entertaining, brutal fights that there's been in a long time. Because of that, a lot of people are saying they should run it back. And hey, I agree, but it's going to be a long, long while before either of these women are healed up and ready to fight again. That being said, though, there was an absolutely amazing championship fight in Invicta the night before, and we're going to talk about that video next week. 
But continuing to work our way backwards through the card, we get to the featured prelim of the evening, and that was the return of Sugar Sean O'Malley, who won by a TKO in the very first round. I mean, after being out of MMA competition for two years due to USADA issues, he put away Kiones in two minutes and two seconds with absolute ease. In the two years he's been away, he's not only been training jujitsu and competing in jujitsu competitions, but he said he's also been training his mind. And when he was in the cage, you could just tell he was so lucid and cognizant and focused and in the moment. Also in this two years away, he's filled out more. He's not a big guy by any means, but he's not scrawny like he was before, even saying when he watched his old matches that the dude he is now would fuck that dude up. Now, in the fight, he was using great feints to get reads, beautiful footwork to keep Keone's guessing and, and a bit confused. And Sean just made it look like Keone shouldn't even have been in there with him. And this is someone who actually has the second highest striking defense in the bantamweight division and got taken out in two minutes. He also did something though in particular that I've personally never seen done before which is punching sort of into a throw. He came in with a counter right and instead of bringing his hand back to his face like most fighters would, he just continued through and pushed Keones to the floor and when Keones got back up he threw a head kick and his foot wrapped right around the guard sent him to the canvas and from there he just wailed on him for a couple seconds and the ref stopped it. Now, like the recent Connor fight that only took 40 seconds, it's hard to really get a whole lot of info from this fight. Sean himself even saying, I have so, so many more tools and so much more sweet finishes I, and I wanted to show more, but you know, it is what it is. But being completely uninjured, I'd like to see a quick turnaround. But unfortunately, most of the cars up until July are pretty filled up. So hopefully the latest we see him is during International Fight Week, which I believe is the first, maybe the second week of July. Because I don't think that car is completely filled up yet. And that'll give him time to get another full fight camp in and, and work on the weight cut a little bit more. Because since he is a bit more filled out, he came in at... 135 which is okay for now with the one pound weight allowance but if he were to get into a title fight he can't come in over 135 so just a small adjustment that he'll probably have to make and i'm super confident that him and this team will work that out I'm super duper excited to see his ground game. And he was apparently in the Quintent Ultra Series only last month. So after I'm done working on this video, I'm going to go back and watch that. And I'm thinking at some point between now and his next fight, I'm actually going to do a whole video just on Sean. Little side note, Keones was talking a bunch of shit before this fight. And he looked so pissed when Sean was getting his hand raised. Not an important point. It's just funny. It made me smile. Some quick honorable mentions before we wrap this up. Neil Magny made his own return after about a year and a half and made his opponent Li Jing Lang, who's been on a tear recently, just look completely outclassed. And that was as a decent betting underdog at 180, 185, something around there. But Neil Dariush spent the whole first round on Draker Close's back and then after getting rocked in the second round, knocked Close the hell out while still in the middle of being dazed I don't think he had even cleared the cobwebs yet which actually brings us to the Joe Rogan moment of the week because I'm bringing that back I mean look at this reaction him and DC this this is a priceless moment right here and to close out the show, I actually want to give big props to the man who opened up the night during the early prelims, Batgeri Dana, I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, who demolished his opponent, Guido Canetti, with a very unorthodox left hook. I think he's the only fighter on the roster that's from Mongolia, so good work repping your country because there aren't many fighters who are the only fighters on the roster from their country. Oh, and in other news, Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder, three totally going down i believe it's the week after international fight week and he 
didn't fire his cornerman Mark Breland, thank God. So there you have it. An epic night of fights that ended in a way that no one really thought that it would. But despite the way it ended, it really was an amazing card. Every fight was good, not all of them amazing, but even the ones that went to decision were pretty damn good. After this comes UFC 249 on April 18th with Khabib versus Ferguson, which is another possible fight of the year contender. I mean, the press conference, was fire. Ferguson was on fire. He actually got under Khabib's skin and I'm just so super ready to watch this fight. It's been in the works for years now. I think this is their fifth time scheduling this fight. But let me know your predictions for that fight or let me know your thoughts on any of the topics I talked about in this week's video. Hit that ding dong below if you don't want to miss out on this or any of the videos I post on this channel. I thank you as always for all of your wonderful support. Here's the breaking double digits and looking forward to breaking triple digits in the future. That's all for this week, and I'll talk to y'all in the next one.